It is good to be back with you tonight and see so many friends we haven't seen in a while. Thank you for coming tonight and to hear the Word of God. Uh, you may be visiting with us tonight and you may have questions on your mind. You may be wanting to know about the Lord's Church you, you read about here in the Scriptures. I can assure you that the North Beaton congregation tries to be like the Lord's Church. When you read of the Lord's Church in the New Testament, when when people came and they asked what to do to be saved, those believers were told to repent of their sins and to confess Christ as their Savior and to be baptized, to have their sins washed away. And upon doing so, the Lord added them to the church. They became part of that body. Uh, they had Christ in them, Galatians 3 and verse 27. They were saved. And God asked us to continue to walk in, in that way. Our series lesson is called, If God is for us, then trust him. Then trust him. I would imagine that most people here tonight have put Christ on in baptism. And most people here tonight have surrendered their life to Christ at one time in their life, and they're walking in the light. And they have faced struggles. They face hard times. And a lot of times they have just been defeated by the world and not surrendered to God and trusted in him. And I would imagine that has happened at one time or another to every one of us. Every one of us. From our text of the series, uh, Romans chapter 8 and verse 31, it says, If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his only son, but gave him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? God gave his son to die for us. God, while we were sinners, Romans 5 and verse 8, he allowed his son to die for us, completely undeserving, and show us the way, the way that we can have salvation, the way that we can live in victory every day that we live, the way that we can have something greater within us than we find within the world. And yet there are things sometimes that really try us. They really pull on our heartstrings. They really cause us to maybe drift the way away from God instead of following his path. This morning, we talked, first of all, in talking about if God is for us and trust him, we, we answered the question, why? Why should we trust him? And for our worship service, we, we answered the question of how do we handle the doubts and we've seen some great people, men and women in faith in Scripture, who doubted. Even Abraham doubted at one time. But we looked at faith as being something that is a journey and not something that we just all of a sudden achieve. It is something that we continue to grow in. And it's all right to question it. Just like doubting Thomas questioned it. It's okay. As long as we question it and let the Word of God be our answer. Our lesson tonight is to answer the question, if God is for us, can we trust him with our past? Can we trust him with the things that we have faced in our past? If you have your Bibles, open them please to Mark the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2. I agree that there are some wounds that we face in this life that take a long time to heal. They take a long time for us to get over some that we will never forget that are on our mind. And some Christians struggle with the things that have happened such a long time ago. And, you know, it is just amazing, though, how the capacity of the past, how that power has the way to incarcerate the present. How it has a way to, to drag us down. How it has a way to keep us from being the people we need to be for, for God. How it has a way to keep us from, from going public, that I'm a Christian, that the greatest thing that ever happened in my life was to put Christ on in baptism to be blessed, to be part of his church. And sometimes the past 
has a way to keep us because we're afraid. We're afraid of what someone else may say or the judgment someone else may get. Several years ago, well, a couple of years ago, I don't know if you saw it on 60 Minutes, there's a group of people in our country that suffer from a rare conditions that doctors call superior autobiographical memory. Superior autobiographical memory. That people, these people, can remember every detail in their life. At the University of California, they're doing a research on a lady, and for the past six years they've done this research. Her name is Joe Price. And she can remember every single day of her life since she was 14 years of age. She can recall every moment of that day. She can give you just a total write-up about every single thing that happened in every day since she was 14 years of age. And you may think, wow, that is awesome to have such a strong memory. But she doesn't see it that way. Because for her, that's a burden. Because she cannot forget every wound that someone did to her. Everything that someone may have said that was, that was hurtful. Every unkind thing. Every unthoughtful thing that someone had done. Every mistake that she made. Every sin that she committed. She cannot forget that. She cannot forget every bad decision. In every embarrassing moment, it comes before her and she said, I cannot sleep at night because of these things of my past. She is imprisoned by her memory. And she says it's just wrecking her life. See, there's few types of bondage that's greater than the bondage of the burdens of our past and the prisons of our past that we keep remembering them, that they keep holding us back, that they keep the light of God from shining through and us being the people that we need to be for God. But the good news is, God is for us. And we can trust Him. We can trust Him to help guide us through these things that have happened in our past. So look at Mark chapter 1. Let's see what, chapter 2, let's see what God has to say. Mark chapter 2 and look at verse 1. It says, again he, that is Christ, entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive him, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken through, they let him down, let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their face, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your heart? Which is easier? To say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, arise, take up your bed, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has the power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go your way to your house. And immediately he arose and took up the bed 
and went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. So here's another amazing day in the life of Jesus. And don't you know that if you were following him around, every day was amazing. You would just be caught on every word that he said. What an amazing day. You would go to bed at night excited about, about what you had heard that day. You would wake up in the morning so excited to have another amazing day with Jesus. And he goes to this house and he's going for a preaching service, not a healing service. And he heals this man. And notice that Jesus' critics are not upset that he heals a man, but they are upset that he forgives the man. And my guess is that even the man's friends that brought him there were probably a little bit confused because they did not bring their friend. They did not go to all of this trouble to, to hear Jesus say, your sins are forgiven. They were expecting you were healed. The paralysis is all gone, but you are healed. They didn't get on that roof and dig a hole through that roof and lower their friend down to Jesus to hear, you are forgiven. They thought that they knew what their friend needed the most. But Jesus knew. He knew there was a need that was so much greater than they themselves realized. Jesus knew that this man could not walk on his feet until he learned to walk in the Lord as a forgiven man. See, every time Jesus heals somebody, he drives back death. Every time he heals somebody, he's announcing that I am with you and you can trust me. But Jesus' miracle, greatest miracle, it was not walking on water. It was not healing the lame or helping the blind see. It was not raising up dead Lazarus. The greatest miracle of Jesus is this. He has the authority to forgive. He has the authority to offer forgiveness. And it is the reception and the appreciation of this forgiveness that is the key to trusting in God, trusting what he has for us. Psalms 130, verse 3, it says, If you, O Lord, should mark my iniquity, O Lord, who could stand? Who could stand if God were just marking down every sin that we committed? And think about that. If God was a sin record keeper, then we'd all be paralyzed. Verse, the very next verse of that, it says, but there is forgiveness with you. God offers, he extends forgiveness no matter how great our sin is, no matter what we have done, no matter how long we've done it, he extends and he offers forgiveness to everybody. And maybe that's why there are so many people who live in all kinds of prisons in relational prisons and emotional prisons and spiritual bondage because of our natural inability to believe and to surrender to God and to receive the fact that God is for us and that you can trust him to forgive every one of your sins. That he's not only the God of a second chance, but he's the God of a third chance and a fourth chance. And a fifth chance. Remember when Peter talked to Jesus? Well, how long shall? How many times shall we forgive people? Seven times. Oh, Jesus said it's much more than that. So let's look at some liberating truths that come from God's word. First of all, if God is for us, and you can trust Him, then when you surrender your life to Jesus Christ. You are no longer defined by your past wrongs. I know the world sees it different from that, but shame on the world. They don't know Jesus. They don't know the truth about the Word of God. That you are no longer defined by what has happened in your life. And the Bible is full of 
who, what we call heroes, great heroes, who had some serious skeletons in their closet issues. So things that they did that were just terrible. Abraham lied. Moses murdered. David committed adultery. He lied about it. He killed a man. Peter, after walking with Jesus, seeing his miracles, hearing words like no man had ever heard before, he denied Jesus the Savior. Paul persecuted people who followed Jesus Christ. Yet they all surrendered their lives to God. And because of that, they're not remembered for their issues. They're not remembered for their sins. They are remembered for the great life they lived in Jesus Christ. And you know what? We hear these lessons. We hear these lessons when we come to worship, and we nod our head because we know these are great lessons. But why is it that for some reason we think that our sins are greater than the heroes in the Bible, than the things that they did? Where do you think these thoughts come from? Do they come from the Bible? Do they come from God? You know, I had a, a tie once that I really, really, really did like. And I took my tie to a restaurant. It must have been after services on Sunday. <laughs> and I spilt something on my tie. And I was just so upset it was on my tie. So I took it home. Jean did her magic on that tie. I mean, she got that spot. You would have to have a magnifying glass. And if you had that magnifying glass, you could barely see that little line to where that spot was. You could stand three feet from me and not see it. But you know what? I knew it was there. I have never worn that tie again. I knew it was there. No one else knew it was there. But I knew it was there. And that's the way sin can be. You can be taking a shower. You can be going to school or to work. You can be trying to sleep. And that sin of your past just comes back. And it just eats at you. It destroys a night. It destroys a moment. It destroys your worship as you're sitting in services. It destroys the way you want to go out and talk to people. And maybe you have been baptized for the remission of your sins. Maybe you've gone forward and you've asked for forgiveness for what you've done. You publicly confess it. But the stain's still there and you know it. And you know it. Yet it still comes back to haunt you. Where does that thought come from? Where does that happen? God does not haunt Christians with the memory of their past. He offers them, he extends to them forgiveness to forgive every sin, everything time that we have fallen back. He offers forgiveness when a person surrenders to Christ and puts him on in baptism, all those sins are washed away. And as a Christian, when you, when you respond and ask for forgiveness, God forgives you. And here's what God's Word says about sin, that He has forgiven. Listen to Psalms 103 in verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far as He, that is God, removed our transgressions from us. Now think about this for a moment. If you go north, you ever thought why God didn't say, as far as the, the, the north is from the south? Because if you go north, at some point, you're going to start going south. But if you go east, you will never go west. You will never go west. That's how far God has removed a penitent sinner's sin from him. He doesn't ever bring it back up. He doesn't ever think about it again. 
He doesn't ever want you to think about it forget. You are a forgiven person. Your sin is gone by the blood of Jesus Christ. God said in Micah chapter 7 and verse 19, Cast all your sins into the depths of the sea. Yet we have such a struggle applying God's forgiveness to our past, to the things we deal with in our past. And, and this produces all kinds of bondage, including and especially religious bondage to keep us from being the people that we need to be. How many of us have bought the lie that if we just go to church, that we just sing those songs, that if we just be religious, maybe God will make a deal with me about the stain in my life. See, the Old Testament, there are some really intricate details about the furniture that, remember, that went into the, the tabernacle. And later, that furniture went into the temple. But you ever notice that in all of the furniture, there was never a chair there? There was never a chair because there was always one more sacrifice to do, one more offering to give. But when you enter into the New Testament, we learn that that Jesus was sacrificed. He ascended back into heaven to be with God. And he says, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. When Christ was on the cross and he says, it is finished. That means it was final. It was a sufficient, the all-sufficient sacrifice for us. No more does there have to be another sacrifice for us. He was the last and he was the final sacrifice for every, for every one of us. Now when someone enters into Christ, they are not a pardoned convict who's always going to have a record about their past who's always going to be called, well, this is what you did five years ago, or this is what you did when you were a teenager, or this is what you did years ago. When a penitent believer believes, confesses Jesus Christ as their Savior, and they are baptized into Christ for the remission of their sins, those sins are washed away. Every one of them. They are washed away, and they are or an adopted child of God. See, God is for us. And we can trust Him. And let me tell you why. Because what God has done for you is greater than anything, anything that will ever be done for you. What God has done for you is greater than anything that you will ever have done to you because of what he has done and what he extends to us. No one will ever do anything so great as what he has done for us. But secondly, it's not just the wrongs of our past that have a way to dwarf, dwarf our spiritual lives and to put out that spark of Jesus Christ within our hearts. But it's also our wounds. It's the wounds we, we receive from those out there. And there's probably no greater wound than from a brother or sister that's in our family or that's in the Lord's church. And from those things that happen, trusting in God is something that we can do, is realizing that you are no longer confined by those wounds, that you are no longer defined by those wounds. But some people... They let their wounds become their prison. They let the wrongs of what others done, have done really incarcerate them to keep them from being the people that God wants us to be. The army has a slogan, be all that you can be. And we can never be that way if we allow these wounds and these wrongs to pull us down. No one has to live that way because the scriptures tell us that God is for us. 
and you can trust him. Every one of us, every one of us has done the father wrong. Every one of us has sinned. Everybody here has sinned. And everyone here has been done wrong by somebody. The problem with that is that holding on to those wrongs will never turn out right. It'll never make you a better person. It'll never make you a, a better Christian. It'll never make you a better person to, to help bring someone to Christ and teach them the word. And the only way that we can escape the paralysis of bitterness is forgiveness. Is to have a heart of forgiveness that is willing to forgive others that we have become a slave to their wounds. To have that heart that you don't hate that person and you want them to offer, to extend, you extend that forgiveness to them and you want them to change their life. A heart of forgiveness is the way to keep you from being chained from a past that you cannot change. You cannot go back and undo a wound. You can't take the words back that you have said or that someone else has said. But it doesn't have to be your prison because of your Heavenly Father. You can trust Him. We can trust God to forgive us no matter how bad we've sinned. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25, God said he is therefore able to save us to the uttermost those who come to Christ through him. To save to the uttermost no matter how bad we've sinned. And we should have a heart for forgiveness also. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32, Paul speaking to Christians, be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, Forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. That's what we are responsible to do. Paul wrote those words, and he knew what it was like. Because he himself had been a, a persecutor of, of Christians. So he knows what he has been forgiven for. And he knows how important forgiveness is. When we remember what we have been forgiven for, that opens up our eyes to know how forgiving we need to be. Because of forgiveness, he could say in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14, that I don't look behind me, but I press on toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus, my Lord. Every one of us has a past Every one of us and any one of us can have a future of freedom. Any one of us. Because God is for us and you can trust him. Paul reminds Christians in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the richness of his grace. And let me tell you, it doesn't get any better than knowing that. It doesn't get any better than that. Some think that they know what they need most, but they are wrong. What you may think you need most is, what you, is not what you need most. What we need most of all is knowing that God is for us and we can trust him. We can trust him to forgive us. We can trust him that we can extend forgiveness to those who, who, are, who have wronged us. Jesus went to the cross. He shed his blood on the cross so that everyone could be free. After Christ died, after he ascended back into heaven, but before he ascended in Mark 16, 15, and 16, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, and he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. And after Christ ascended, when people asked what to do to be saved, they were told to repent and to be baptized. 
First Peter chapter 3 and verse 21, whereunto even baptism does also now, so, also now save us. Every example of someone becoming a Christian, that's what they did. We don't have to rationalize it. I don't know where the expression just accept Jesus into your heart and you'll be saved. I don't know where that came from. It's not in the scriptures. I don't know where it came from to say, well, just say the sinner's prayer. Have you ever seen some of these Bibles? You look in there in the back of it and said, well, you've got to say this prayer and you're saved. Where did that come from? Because it's not found in the scripture. It's not found there. And it's kept so many people in bondage. And that means that you need to take your path to the cross. Whatever it's been, to the cross for God to forgive you. One last verse. Look at Psalms 119. Psalms 119. Some of us have lived a long time in bondage. The danger with that is it can become a place to where we think is normal. But it's not normal. It's not where God wants his people. It's not where we need to be. David appreciated the forgiveness that God gave him. He appreciated that. And notice what is said in Psalms 119 and in verse 45. Verse 45. God's word says, I will walk at liberty, for I seek your precepts. I will speak your testimonies also before kings and will not be ashamed. And just right there, you can see he realized that he had been forgiven of what he had done, the terrible things that he had done. He had been forgiven. That's not going to stop him from talking to the greatest leaders in the land. He goes on to say, And I will delight myself in your commands, which I love. My hands also I will lift up to your commandments, which I love. And I will meditate on your statutes. He realized where he had been. He realized what he had done. And he realized through his penitent spirit his, the forgiveness he had received and what he had come out of. And that's the refreshing things that we are blessed with when we come out of that. David could say that because he learned God is for him and he, we can trust him. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32, he says, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Living in bondage can become normal if we're not careful. But God, God is willing and wants to set you free. Walking in the light of Christ is what we need much more than what we think we need. Are you tired of the bondage? Are you tired of it? Are you tired of dwelling on the past? Are you tired of when it's stunning your faith and your growth and your light? that God wants you to have. Why don't you surrender your life to Jesus? Why don't you go to him in prayer? If you've never put Christ on in baptism, why don't you do that today and leave here a free person, surrendered to Jesus with all your sins forgiven? Maybe you're looking for a church home and you'd like to place your workmanship here. Maybe you just need the prayers of the church. Brother Orbison will meet you down front and we'll be glad to pray on your behalf. But whatever your need, won't you come? As together we stand and as we sing.